Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the museum's night TV studio for a special edition of Inside Media. I'm Jim Duff, CEO here at the museum, and uh, I would like to begin with just a brief recitation and background for the program today as we welcome Ken Duberstein here. Uh, it's a great honor to have Ken with us. On June 12, 1987, on an overcast day in Berlin, President Ronald Reagan stood in front of the Brandenburg Gate and the Berlin Wall and challenged Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall. 25 years later, it is regarded by many as President Reagan's most stirring and memorable speech. Bild, Germany's largest selling newspaper, proclaimed that President Reagan's great speech changed the world. As for the phrase, tear down this wall, Time Magazine called it the four most famous words of President Reagan's presidency. Today, we are joined by Ken Duberstein, a close advisor to President Reagan, who accompanied him to Berlin. Uh, we want to look back at that historic speech and its effect on the end of the Cold War. Ken served as the White House Chief of Staff under President Reagan from 1988 to 1989 and as Deputy Chief of Staff in 1987 uh, when Howard Baker was Chief of Staff. He was also assistant to the President for Legislative Affairs during President Reagan's first term. Prior to joining the Reagan administration, Ken was Vice President and Director of Business Government Relations of the Committee for Economic Development, and he began his career here in Washington as a public servant as an assistant to Senator Jacob Javits. Many of you know him today, more recently, as a consultant. Uh, on, he was a consultant on the NBC series West Wing. <laughs> he appears as a commentator uh, on Meet the Press and many other programs, including This Week. And he is currently chairman and CEO of the Duberstein Group here in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ken Duberstein here today. <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming in from the hot air. <laughs> uh, Jim, it's great being with you. Uh, also with Jan Newharth, who's chairman of the Freedom Forum, and her Blue Ribbon Award-winning husband, Joseph. Um, thanks for the opportunity for me to tell those recollections of that famous speech with all my kids here. We're, we're delighted um, they're here with us. And uh, with all the students from the Institute of Politics, I hope some of them got in. <laughs> there we go. Great. Oh, yeah, but Harvard, all right. Terrific. Thank you. You're in the back row. You, should, uh, you, you must have got the, uh, the less expensive tickets. So. <laughs> <laughs> and let me not overlook, of course, my darling wife, Jacqueline, who's here. Jackie, it's <laughs> good to have you with us as well. Well, it's a very appropriate place to have this uh, interview in the museum. We have uh, the largest section of the Berlin Wall right. outside of Germany housed here in the museum, and it's a great display of, uh, of a, uh, an exhibit concerning our freedoms. Uh, and so we're especially grateful uh, that you're here with us today, Ken. Okay. As we get started, I'd like to show a brief uh, clip that was produced by our staff here at the museum, which gives us a little background to President Reagan's uh, historic speech. Let's play the clip. In June of 1987, President Ronald Reagan commemorated the 750th birthday of Berlin with a speech at the Berlin Wall. Behind him rose the majestic Brandenburg Gate. We come to Berlin, we American presidents, because it's our duty to speak in this place of freedom. We on his speechwriting staff knew what material would work for him. The clarity, the sense of vision, the sense of, of, of drama and moral purpose toward which the president was always reaching in his speeches. Peter Robinson was 30 years old when he was assigned to compose that speech. He saw Berlin for the first time as a member of the advance team which visited the divided city in April. To Robinson, the Berlin Wall was nothing short of monstrous. You felt the weight of history. Standing at that wall, 13 foot high wall, you're in West Berlin so the wall goes all around the city and at the site where the president spoke, you could look down and see crosses that had been erected where people had been killed 
trying to escape over the wall. But Robinson was told by the top U.S. diplomat in Berlin not to let the president even mention the wall in the speech. Because they were deep inside East Germany, they were aware of all the necessity for subtlety and nuance and East-West relations. And he said, just don't, don't make a big deal about the wall. They've gotten used to it by now. Since its construction in 1961, the wall had divided families and kept them worlds apart within their own city. At a dinner party, Robinson asked Berliners if they were, in fact, used to the wall. And then our hostess, a lovely woman, Ingeborg Eltz, but she became angry. And she said, if this man Gorbachev is serious with this talk of glasnost and perestroika, he can prove it by coming here and getting rid of that wall. Mikhail Gorbachev went to Berlin in late May, just weeks before President Reagan. And while East German communist leader Eric Honecker extended a warm public greeting, Gorbachev's policies of openness and engagement received the cold shoulder. President Reagan's top advisors did not want the president to challenge Gorbachev, but Reagan had already read through the speech and he liked what he saw. The president thought for a moment and he said, well, um, there's that uh, call to tear down the wall. Uh, that wall has to come down. That's what I want to say to those people on the other side of the wall. To those listening in East Berlin, a special word. Although I cannot be with you, I address my remarks to you just as surely as to those standing here before me. If the president's going to speak in front of the Berlin Wall, he needs to call, that's just Ronald Reagan. You can't put him there and not expect him to say it ought to come down. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. President Reagan fought the final battle to preserve the challenge to Gorbachev just hours before delivering the speech. He leaned over and slapped Ken on the knee and said, the boys at the State Department aren't going to like this, but it's the right thing to do. Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I was trying to write a good piece of work for my boss, Ronald Reagan, and get it in on deadline. The speech didn't register as historic until the wall came down. Live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. But let the record always show that it wasn't Ronald Reagan who tore down the wall, and it wasn't Mikhail Gorbachev who tore down the wall. It was the people of Germany, in particular of East Germany. It was the German people who themselves who put their shoulders against that rotten old structure and heaved it down. Those are uh, great wow. clips, and uh, thanks to our staff for putting that together. Let's talk about the days leading up to the great speech, Ken, and, and uh, I, I've had the good fortune of working with Senator Baker over the years, and he's fond of telling the story that he wanted the line out and uh, drawn through a, a, a couple of drafts. It almost didn't make it into the speech, and some of the top advisors were advising against it. Would uh, let's set the backdrop for, for the speech. Uh, speech and that line in particular. Well, Howard wasn't the only one who had opposition. <clears throat> when you circulate a presidential speech, it goes through something called the interagency clearance process. The State Department objected to that one paragraph in the speech. So did, on behalf of the State Department, the National Security Council in the White House. Peter Robinson, who you just heard from, was a hell of a speechwriter, <laughs> age 30. And he was fighting hard for this speech draft. The communications director at the White House, Tom Griscom, agreed with him and fought hard against the NSC and the State Department. Before we left for Italy and then Germany, we had gone through everybody's arguments and it had stayed in the speech. We flew first to Venice because there was an economic summit, a G7, about to happen. 
And unlike these days where everything is on the 747, we flew on the old Boeing 707, which was Air Force One. And so there was a lot of jet lag and a lot of time. The Reagans flew to Venice and went into seclusion for three days, where they stayed at a villa outside of Venice. We left the United States on June 3rd. On June 5th, I visited the villa with Frank Carlucci, who was then National Security Council advisor. And we did our usual briefings, and then the president and I spent some time afterwards talking through this speech. And the president said to me, what do you think? And I said, Mr. President, I think it's a hell of a speech and a hell of a line, but you're president, you get to decide. <laughs> and he looked at the speech, and he looked at the so-called offending paragraph and said, well, Ken, I, I think we'll leave it in. And that was on June 5th. And on June 6th, we flew to the Vatican to be with Pope John Paul II. And then we came back to the villa, and then we flew on to Venice for the economic summit. And there was still back and forth from the interagency process, the State Department. And on the day before the speech, George Schultz, our wonderful Secretary of State, took me aside and said, I just want you to know, Ken, that I share the department's objection with the speech and with that paragraph, and I hope you'll convey my views to the president. And I knew at that very moment the speech in that paragraph was okay. <laughs> because since I kind of had a handle on the president's calendar, I knew George Schultz well enough to know that if he wanted to really object, he would have asked me for 10 minutes on the president's calendar. But he didn't. <laughs> so in other words, he was saying to his bureaucracy, I'm covered. And Ken, if that speech paragraph blows up, it's on your shoulders, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> um, let me set the rest of the stage. We went on to Berlin, and we met with Chancellor Kohl, Helmut Kohl, who President Reagan thought the world of. We met with him at the Reichstag, the old legislature from before World War II. We stood on a balcony that was glass enclosed, facing the Berlin Wall. Helmut Kohl pointed out to us, as our Secret Service pointed out to us, is that anything that was said out in the balcony could be heard by the East Germans, hmm. by their police, because of the sensitivity of the microphones. Reagan was confronted. He had been in Berlin once before, but he was confronted starkly right in front of us with this mammoth creature called the Berlin Wall with crosses pointed, painted on the wall where people had been shot and killed. It was an unbelievably emotional moment. We departed right from there to the Brandenburg Gate. I had the honor of being in the limousine with the president. And in these days of teleprompters, he was using a prepared speech, not a teleprompter. And everybody refers to him as the great communicator. And part of the reason is that he always rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And so one last time, he was going through the document, through the speech, on his lap in the back of the limousine. And we got to that paragraph, and as Peter pointed out, the president turned to me and said, it's going to drive the State Department boys crazy, but we're going to leave, the speech, we're going to leave that line in. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, the signature line of the eight years of President Reagan. But let me also add that in the day before we arrived in Berlin, according to all press reports from the Washington Post and New York Times, Helen Thomas of the AP, there had been massive demonstrations in West Germany, mm -hmm. in West Berlin, protesting President Reagan's visit, protesting our views on disarmament, 
protesting our policies in the Middle East. They had burned down buildings, they had torched cars, and so you got to put that into context as well. As we arrived in Berlin, things were quiet, mm -hmm. but the night before had been very treacherous. Peter Robinson, actually there was an article that appeared in Saturday's Wall Street Journal by Peter, and he mentioned that, uh, you repeated some of uh, what we saw in the video clips, but he also mentioned that there were no less than seven drafts that came back from the State Department, seven different versions, seven alternative versions uh, to the speech. Is that unusual, is that odd, uh, or, or was the speech, even at, the, at its inception, viewed as uh, one of such historic importance? Seven is a bit much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we knew this was gonna be the capstone of the 10 days of a G7 economic summit and the visit to the Pope, which was significant in itself, mm -hmm. but where was the major news it would have to be in this Berlin Wall speech? Uh, you usually go through two or three drafts, mm -hmm. but they fought it to the very end. <laughs> because they thought it would be provocative, too provocative, and would undermine Gorbachev's efforts at Glasnost and Perestroika. Mm -hmm. As history proved, it enhanced the efforts on Glasnost and Perestroika rather than taking away from that. Right. Uh, what, were the what was the political environment at home at the time? Were, were there motivations to get the president uh, to Berlin uh, on the domestic front? Were there other things uh, broiling? Or was this uh, just a long thought out strategy of his overall foreign policy and uh, outreach? When Howard Baker and I came to the White House, I came back, he came. President Reagan was at 37% in the polls. It was the depths of Iran-Contra. People were saying of Ronald Reagan that he was not a, just a lame duck, he was a dead duck with two years to go in his administration. One of the key strategies that President Reagan laid down was that we would try to capture from building up in the first term in our military to somehow build down in the second term. He had felt that Gorbachev in his meetings in Geneva and then in Reykjavik, which everybody reported at the time was not successful and it turned out to be pivotal, that there was an opportunity for a significant nuclear arms reduction with Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. But his political standing at home was very low. It was the lowest of his presidency and it started coming back. Three months later was the Berlin Wall speech where people started recognizing, my God, the United States is back. And the president is gonna be that forceful and that direct with the leader of the then Soviet Union. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Mr. Gorbachev, open the gate. It didn't receive great coverage in America, but I think the American people understood that their forceful, direct president was about to have a major breakthrough. It, and it did uh, have a, a tremendous impact, certainly in the long run. In the immediate aftermath of it, what was the reaction uh, in Germany um, and, and the United States? Uh, the, the, most of the reaction was that we were a little bit too belligerent, <laughs> that we had uh, maybe taken some steps to undermine Gorbachev. Uh, and his efforts at Glasnost and Perestroika, that we were on tender soil. But it fit in very much with the Ronald Reagan of the evil empire, on the one hand, and on the other hand, let's hold out some hope. If you look at the whole speech, it is one of hope and liberalization and trust and encouragement and standing together in this fight against totalitarianism. This is not supposed to be and wasn't a, what we thought a provocative speech, but rather one that held out an olive branch. If you truly want liberalization, if you're truly serious, it's not just gestures, it's meaningful change, mm 
then the one thing that you can do is come here to this wall, tear down this wall. It's interesting that the line appeared uh, in the middle of a speech. And it was a long speech, actually. It was a very lengthy speech. Well, uh, if you can't roll the tape again, obviously. Right. But if you saw the tape, after he says, open this gate, and there's big applause, and he says, Mr. Gorbachev, and here is the training of the actor. Because it was being swallowed out by applause, he started again so that he could get the whole line not drowned out. And so it was Mr. Gorbachev, applause. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the place erupted. That's the actor's training of he Ronald a, Reagan. He was a great communicator. Right, right. That's absolutely. Absurd. There are other great lines in the speech, and I, I, I brought a copy of it with me uh, that have been sort of overlooked over time because of the power of that great line. Uh, this is not an original copy, by the way, so our curators don't need to worry, but uh, <laughs> we, got, we got this off the internet. But, uh, uh, he, he, what, the penultimate paragraph of the speech, he says, as I look out a moment from the Reichstag, the embod that embodiment of German unity, I noticed words crudely spray painted upon the wall, perhaps by a young Berliner. This wall will fall. Beliefs become reality, end of the quote on the, on the wall. Yes, across Europe, this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith. It cannot withstand truth. The wall cannot withstand freedom. Well, those are great lines. Uh, and and, and uh, yet sort of lost in history in a way because of the power of the uh, tear down this wall line. Well, Jim, you know, President Reagan also was aware that the speech was being broadcast all over Germany, including in East Berlin. And we had set up loudspeakers so that anybody could get anywhere near close to the uh, Berlin Wall in East Berlin could hear the speech. So Reagan knew that he was speaking to all of Eastern Europe, all of Western Europe. And this was his moment. And this was America's moment. So the story goes, 10 years ago, I was in Frankfurt, Germany giving a speech. And after the speech, a young woman came over to me with a heavy German accent. And she had tears in her eyes. And I, I usually, when I finish speeches, don't leave people with tears in their <laughs> eyes. <laughs> and she said, I want to thank you for working for your President Reagan. And I said, please tell me. And she told me that she had grown up in East Berlin. As a young girl, her parents had taken her as close as they could get to hear your president speak at the Brandenburg Gate. And President Reagan changed my life and my family's life. And by this time, I had tears in my <laughs> eyes. And I said to her, do you mind me asking you what you do now? And all of a sudden, she got very modest and very shy and looked down and said, I'm an investment banker with Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> if Ronald Reagan had not had Alzheimer's at the time, that would have been his new favorite story. <laughs> you can talk about the welfare queen and everything else. It was, I'm an investment banker. But here it was, the power of that speech, the fact that people in East Berlin were listening, and that a year and a half after President Reagan left office, the wall came down. Wow. Where were you when the wall came down? And, and what were you feeling? I was, trans I was transfixed to a television. Oh. I couldn't sleep. Uh, the next day, I spoke with President Reagan. I was going to ask him. Uh, it was November of 1989. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think that the president, and certainly I, thought that the Berlin Wall would be coming down as quickly as it did. Mm -hmm. But we had a little clue, because you have to look at all of these events as a continuum. Uh, President Reagan met with General Secretary Gorbachev, not only at the summit meetings here in Washington in uh, the end of 87 or in Moscow in 88, but we also met at Governor's Island early in, uh, at, late in 1988, and we brought with us President-elect George Herbert Walker Bush as a ceremonial passing of the torch. Gorbachev was in, uh, in New York to give a speech at the United Nations. The lunch was seven Soviet, seven Russians, and seven of us Americans. Gorbachev began the lunch by talking about the problems he was having in the then Soviet Union with the bureaucracy, the nomenclatura. He talked about he was not sure that he could prevail with glasnost and perestroika. And he looked across the table at his friend, President Reagan, and said, what advice do you have? <laughs> what do you think? And Reagan, ever so gently, said, my friend, Mr. General Secretary, the bureaucracy is the same the world over. <laughs> the only way you can overcome the bureaucracy is to have the people on your side. What that means is less money for missiles and more money for consumer goods, less money for defense, and more money for housing and clothing and food and education. And looking across the table in Gorbachev's eyes, I realized that either way he turned, it was over. <laughs> because he couldn't turn on the defense and the bureaucracy, the military and the bureaucracy, and he couldn't sell out to the Russian people. And it was that combination which led to, less than a year later, the Berlin Wall coming down. So you knew that things were really starting to move hmm. when Gorbachev began that lunch. Did, uh, did they ever talk about that speech and those lines, uh, or that particular line? Not in my presence. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think they did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. So there was no immediate feedback from the Soviet Union? Well, the there was feedback through uh, cables, et cetera, mm. that were not all that pleased with the, the tone of the speech or yeah. the comments. Yeah. But uh, obviously things accelerated. And George Shultz, among others, credits that speech now mm -hmm with accelerating talks on the uh, intermediate ballistic missile, which we uh, signed a treaty to severely take down the number here in Washington in December of 87. Right. Uh, I think that speech really was fundamental mm -hmm. to ending the Cold War. It really gave impetus and got the Soviets Gorbachev, et cetera, to do what they knew that they had to do in order to balance out some of taking care of the people of Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that vice really started hammering that led to the treaty signed in Washington and then the very successful summit uh, that President Reagan had with uh, General Secretary Gorbachev in Moscow mm -hmm. June of next year, that next year. Did President Reagan realize the impact almost immediately that the speech was going to have, or did did you discuss it afterwards? Uh, I assume you, I don't know if you got back in the same limo you were in on the way to the speech, but did uh, what what were, what was your conversation like with him afterwards? Well, as he said in his diaries, there were people as far as the eye could see. And he couldn't see that far. <laughs> um, he was taken with a response 
from the audience, mm -hmm. was curious about, did the loudspeakers really work? Because hmm. he wanted so much to speak to the people in East Berlin as well. And he was optimistic that this was a moment, not the moment, but a moment that put more pressure on and that one of these days can, that wall will come down. Yeah. So we it have came a, down. And it did. We have a, uh, an exhibit uh, here right. uh, at, the, at the museum, as I mentioned, of, uh, of the wall, but we also have film clips of President Reagan as a great communicator, and certainly that line was uh, probably the prime example of it. There have been many others, I think. Do you think that line is what he will be most remembered for, or just one of several? I, I think they're one of several. Mm -hmm. I think that is the signature line of the eight years, because he tore down walls not just in Berlin, but around the world. He opened up trade barriers, I think he tore down walls here in Washington and around our country. You know, in his farewell address, he concluded by saying, we started out to change our country, and I think we wound up maybe changing the world. Not bad, not bad at all for a B-movie actor. <laughs> <laughs> But there were so many moments, that, you know, whether it's the Challenger speech right. on that god-awful day, whether it's the evil empire, but it's really the sunny optimism, the can-do spirit, the morning in America that Ronald Reagan came to symbolize for all of America. Everybody started feeling good about themselves, and it was, we felt good about ourselves here at home, and we had respect around the world. And I think part of that was the leadership of Ronald Reagan if not the major part. I think that's very well put. The uh, article that Peter Robinson wrote in yesterday's uh, Wall Street Journal described it uh, for the people uh, in, in Germany and Europe as an awakening, that they had not, uh, they, they were sort of stuck in, in, in the reality of the wall. And those words awakened a spirit in them that, uh, that uh, that they rose up, and they ultimately tore down the wall. It wasn't uh, Gorbachev that tore down the wall, but it was the people. You gotta remember the moment. The day before the Berlin Wall speech, Margaret Thatcher was elected to a third term as the Prime Minister of the UK, Great Britain. Reagan gives this speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall all of a sudden, there was electricity. It was the Western Alliance. We were all on the march. And the people, as symbolized by that young girl in East Berlin, mm -hmm. said there is hope. In Peter Robinson's video, it's going to visit those people who said, no, we'll never get accustomed to the wall. It must come down. Mm -hmm. And to have the words of the President of the United States who we refer to always as the leader of the free world, come to that wall. And you saw in the video clip the bulletproof glass behind him because our Secret Service wasn't sure that it would be a sniper from the East Berlin. Hmm. These were tense moments in the course of history. And to be that strong but do it in a way of hope and optimism. If you truly want to liberalize, if you mean what you say, here's visible evidence, go do it. And the people of Germany did it, and Gorbachev did it too. Well, Ken, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation because we have a wonderful audience here today, uh, and I know the, Many will have questions to ask of you, too, and you're so gracious to be with us. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of that, if that's all right with you, and uh, Great. get some questions from the audience. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, my name is Johan Legner. I'm a German journalist. I was there in 87. 
Later on, I was at Tempelhof also, perhaps you remember, right. where he met the American community. My question is, uh, I remember several visits of US presidents in West Berlin, but all took place at different locations. Who chose this specific location so close to the wall at the Brandenburg Gate, uh, besides the security concerns? So who was the one who decided we will stay there? The decision to uh, set up a White House event, any White House event, is usually in the domain of the advance office, the people who do the advance work for the White House. Um, President Reagan, as you know, starting with Mike Deaver, always picked venues that communicated. Why would he give the speech at the Reichstag if the Berlin Wall was right next door? That communicated, tear down this wall. That was a clear symbol of the worst atrocities that have been committed with all the crosses and all the deaths of people trying to flee to freedom. It is the same way when you give an environmental speech, you usually do it outdoors now. <laughs> <laughs> you always do it at a place that communicates because you're speaking not just to the audience, but also to TV. The Brandenburg ga Gate, the heft of it, the symbolism of it. If you're gonna go to Berlin and you're gonna give the speech of the nature that President Reagan give, gave, that was in our view, the advance department's view, all the way up to the White House, including Senator Baker, that was the right place to give that ultimate speech. Ken, you mentioned to me that the president was particularly moved when he saw the crosses uh, right. by the wall where, to mark the spots where people were killed trying to climb the wall. Would you, would you mind sharing that with, the, uh, with our audience tonight? Well, too? we stood there for several minutes with Helmut Kohl, the chancellor. Um, <clears throat> the stark reality of a 13-foot wall plus barbed wire knowing that on the other side that there were dog runs, there was glass planted. You couldn't, it was a no man's land. To see how far people had struggled to get over the barbed wire and then be shot before they got to the West. As Reagan said, this is the only wall that's ever been built to keep people in not keep people out. Mm -hmm. He said that with Chancellor Cole. These weren't prepared remarks. This is just standing there and talking. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Helmut Kohl, President Reagan, Jim Kuhn, who was personal aide to the president, and myself standing there. And it was the enormity of the wall, the drabness, the darkness, and knowing that people were, had tried to escape, and there was that cross, and there was that cross, and there was that cross. Yeah. And you leave to go to the Brandenburg Gate with that emotion inside to give a presidential level speech that I think fundamentally changed the course of history. Other questions? Yeah, we're here to celebrate this uh, downing of the wall, and I don't want to diminish it in any way because I too served in Germany in the 60s. Uh, but I wonder if you, you said timing was important here, and I wonder if you could weigh this uh, wall speech with other world events at the time, like we were talking about um, Wallensa and the coal miners and the solidarity movement and all that was going on in Poland and Eastern Europe. Would that have been given him? Ab impetus? You are absolutely right, and I'm glad you raised it. Uh, with Lech Wałęsa, uh, 
uh, there was a movement in Eastern Europe to uh, liberalize. Uh, Gorbachev had announced some liberalization as well. They were taking it, the, uh, the Polish were taking it even further, like Wenza, uh, Havlov in the Czech, the Czech Republic. We're all starting to make these moves toward liberalization. So it was an all coming together. You throw that in with Margaret Thatcher's third term, uh, the election, with the Reagan speech. It was a coming together that was putting massive pressure on the so-called Soviet Union and all the states that they dominated. And that, under that, Gorbachev was trying to balance everything out. That's why I told the story about Governor's Island, because it was all coming to bear on him. But you're absolutely right. Those are some of the other parts that were so fundamental and so important to ultimately the wall coming down a year and a half later. Thank you. The yeah. clip mentioned earlier that it was the citizens of Germany that tore down the wall. But if that line hadn't been left in the speech, in your expert opinion, how do you think President Reagan would have been remembered? I think he would have been remembered as somebody who brought America back from 1980 and the 70s, which were so uh, bad economically that he rebuilt America, rebuilt uh, respect for America around the world. Uh, and he was doing that all the years before 1987. And so now it's an easy symbol to hold on to. But what was the 1984 campaign about? It wasn't about diminishing your opponent. It was about it's morning in America again. We have 7.2% GDP growth. Our unemployment rate is down three points. We're creating millions of new jobs. America is back. So, you know, that's what you take from those years of Ronald Reagan and the capstone of it, clearly in memory now, is the Berlin Wall speech, but it was all that led up to it that counts. Yes. Um, I think what's been sort of touched on here is that obviously relationships were very important during this time period, and he had great relationships with Gorbachev and Thatcher, and they all worked together very closely during this time. And when, I don't know if maybe you had reservations or if you know if President Reagan had reservations when the torch was passed to President H.W. Bush and kind of how different he was in terms of being you know, more reserved and not as outgoing and not as engaged in the in the relationship aspect of it and kind of during that time period obviously everything was set in motion but I don't know if you had any personal feelings about that. Good question. Uh, first of all personal relationships even among heads of state are fundamentally important. President Reagan was very close obviously to Margaret Thatcher as we all know. He also felt very strongly about Helmut Kohl. He also felt very strongly about Brian Mulroney of Canada. He had not the same feelings about Francois Mitterrand of, the, of France. <laughs> um, he had a strong relationship and friendship with Mikhail Gorbachev. One of the other famous lines of Reagan was the Ru Russian proverb that he used all the time. Trust, but verify. And that's what symbolized his relationship with Gorbachev. We used to kid inside the White House that President Reagan, God help us, trusted everybody. And Nancy Reagan and I were the verifiers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he had an awful lot of faith in his vice president, in George Herbert Walker Bush. He thought he was the right person to carry on his presidency into George Herbert Walker Bush's presidency. He knew that the relationship with the then Soviet Union would be solid. That's why we brought George Herbert Walker Bush with us. There is a great photo I'm sure you have in your archives 
It's the only time I was ever allowed to play advanced man in the White House. When we went to Governor's Island in New York Harbor, since I came from New York City, from Brooklyn, New York, the backdrop of Governor's Island is the Statue of Liberty. What symbolized that lunch was Gorbachev flanked by Reagan and Bush, which appeared in all the newspapers, all the front pages, Time Magazine, when it was a thick magazine, and Newsweek. That became the symbol. He had no qualms about George Herbert Walker Bush. He knew what he, his values were, and he knew where he would take the country in the aftermath of eight years of Reagan. It is now public from somebody. But President Reagan, usually every president, leaves their successor a note, a piece of advice. Ronald Reagan could not help but leave George Herbert Walker Bush two pieces of advice, <laughs> one downstairs and one upstairs in the residence. Don't let the turkeys wear you down. <laughs> Keep the faith. <laughs> that answer your question? <laughs> we have uh, time for one more question, please. Um, well, uh, since we, since um, you already fixed the problem of the Berlin Wall of separating two places, like the East Berlin and um, West, um, if there's something like that happens again, like would you do the same thing? Would you do the same thing as um, as you did with the Berlin Wall, or would you do something else? I think you need to have values as a country that are preeminent and predominant. What Ronald Reagan stood for was the consistency of America's purpose. There's no time for waffling. There's no time for indirection. There is time to talk to your adversaries as well as your allies. It is time to put pressure on in a concerted way so that America doesn't go alone, but America leads. And certainly Ronald Reagan did that, and he would do it again if he was confronted with another situation like that god-awful wall. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, Ken, I want to thank you very much for sharing yep. this historic uh, occasion with us and uh, the great light you shed on the, uh, on the history of that moment. And certainly, President Reagan's uh, words, tear down this wall, were inspirational and had great impact. And I think the end of the speech uh, also proved prophetic. The wall did fall. Uh, the wall did not withstand faith. The wall did not withstand truth. And the wall did not withstand freedom. And uh, we're so grateful that you would take the time to be with us here uh, at the museum, uh, sponsored uh, by the Freedom Forum. These are values we all hold dear and you played a pivotal role in world yeah. history. We're grateful for your public service and for your uh, uh, time today. Thank Jim, you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.